Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, makes this amazing declaration. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These are words of praise uttered at the throne of God in heaven. The Lord God indeed is the Almighty. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing God. And this verse also extols the eternal nature of the God whom we serve. It speaks of him who was, who is, and who is to come. Truly, we have gathered this morning, this Sunday morning, in this unique way to do what those in heaven did, to offer praise to our God. We're glad that you're with us. And now we ask you to join with us in singing praise to our awesome God. go to God in prayer. Almighty God, thank you for another day in which we could join one another to worship you and learn more about your word. We pray that you will be with those of our number. Help us to remain firmly, firmly grounded in the faith and not uh, to be swayed by the temptations of the devil, because uh, we knew we know that the, the devil will use a situation like this to discourage us and draw us away from you. So help us to remain strong, Father. Father, we pray that you will be pleased with our worship and that we will be encouraged and uplifted by it. We pray all this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Oh, on
From the earth, from the sky, sky bring forth the joyful cry. Our Lord is King Most High, crucified, we revive. That's why He's King Most High. My Lord is great and good, and He Peter 1, starting in verse uh, 24, it reads, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. In these verses, Peter tells us essentially that our bodies are temporary. He, he says that our, our bodies wither like the grass, he, and he tells us that they fall like the flowers. In other words, what Peter is telling us is that we all must face death, and that's not good news. You know, no one wants to hear anything like that, but Peter leaves us with some hope. He tells us that the good news that we have is forever, but what is this good news? Well, the good news is that the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins, but it's not only that Jesus died for our sins. The good news is also that Jesus has been raised as king, and because of his sacrifice and because of his resurrection, we can also be raised as well. You know, Peter tells us that we, we all are facing death, but we have hope because of the good news. We have hope because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Well, since we're God's people, we're going to use the time that we have now to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and partake of the Lord's Supper. The broken body that, that hung on the cross represents, is represented by the bread, and the blood that was shed on the cross is represented by the fruit of the vine. Let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Good God, we, we know that the biggest problem that we face 
on this earth is, is sin and death. So, so we thank you for sending your son to sacrifice himself to, to fix this problem that, that we are all facing. Uh, we know that it's because of his sacrifice that we don't, we don't need to fear death. Instead, we, we have a future to look forward to with you in eternity. We thank you for loving us, Father, even though uh, we don't deserve it. For all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's go to God in prayer for the fruit of the vine. Almighty God, we thank you again for allowing us to be, to be cleansed from our sins by the blood of your son. We pray that we will never take the sacrifice for granted, and, uh, but that we will always remember that we owe everything to you. Again, we thank you for loving us, for sacrificing your son for us. We pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. God said, I have given you. Our God is a giving God who has continued to provide for us, even in the midst of the current crisis. We now come to that part of our service where we think about our giving back to our Lord. And at this point, I, I want to commend the brothers and sisters who make up the Dallin Road Church family, commend them for their giving. Though we've not been able to meet in our facility, you have not missed a beat in supporting the work of God. Whether you dropped your contribution at the building yesterday, sent a check by mail, or whether you're going to give via PayPal today, your giving makes it possible for the work of God to continue locally and around the world. Let's pray a prayer of blessing. Well, let's go to God in prayer for, for the giving while we try and get Max's audio back. Almighty God, we, we thank you for the blessings that you have shown towards us, your people. We thank you for blessing us with all things, Father, and we pray that we never forget that. Uh, you, don't only, you don't only bless us with our, with our possessions, but you bless us with everything, with life, Father. Father, we pray that as we, we give back to you, we will have this in mind, that you are the true provider. We pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Holy, 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 cleanse and reconcile, holy, wash from sin so high, holy, living undefiled, O Father, make me holy. Oh. 
Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. The Bible begins with a simple but profound statement, in the beginning, God. These words are powerful. They're impressive. They tell us that God is. You know, the Bible never seeks to prove the existence of God to man. Rather, it begins with the assumption that man will recognize the fact that a creator does exist. And God doesn't have to prove his existence any more than I have to prove mine to you. The plain evidence is there. Thinking about the awesome God this morning, well, that gives us a lot to think about. We're going to concentrate a lot of study in these few minutes that are before us. Who is this God, the God who declares himself to be the creator? What do we know about him, about his nature and character? And can we do more than just know about him? Can we know him in the sense of having a relationship with him? Ruben, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, David Banning is in Houston today. We're glad to have you aboard. Yeah, I'm glad to have you back, Max. And I think this is an important study. Uh, just like you said, uh, the Bible just sort of assumes that there is a God. It doesn't really try and prove that a God exists. Uh, I guess it assumes that the evidence is pretty outstanding. It's obvious. Instead, the Bible tries to show us that who that God is, that Jehovah is the God of the universe. So I think this is a good study. You ready to get started? Well, I think so. And I want to begin by just asking the question, who is God? You know, defining God, understanding God is a challenging task because we have limitations with our finite minds. But the Bible does help us. It gives us a lot of terms to consider. Uh, I want to begin where I began just a moment ago, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created, and God is the creator of all that is. Over in Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses, in giving, writing the Ten Commandments, said, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. But there it presents God as being the creator of everything that exists, Reuben. Yeah, that's right. And uh, let me add to that point, just extend that point just a little bit and say that God is the only true creator. Like you said at the very beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, it's interesting that Hebrew word there, God created, that verb there is only ever used of God in scripture, that particular verb that's translated to create. It's only used of God and it's, it's sometimes used in reference to creating something new. And I think that the fact that this word is only used in reference to God teaches us something, and it teaches us something important. It teaches us that there is a creation that only God can do. And I think the idea there is only God can create something truly new. Um, only God can create something from nothing. You know, humans don't really create things. We just kind of reorder things or change things. When, when humans create sort of a new invention, we don't create it from nothing. We are using what God has, has already given us in order to refashion it into something. So humans sort of refashion while God is the one who, who truly creates. He's the true creator. And God being the creator of all that is, that has some very definite consequences, which we're going to address in just a moment. A, a second point that we would make as we think about the awesome God this morning is that God is eternal. He is without beginning and without end. Uh, you know, my daughter, when she was just a little girl, she would ask, Daddy, how old is God? Well, <laughs> you can't put an age on God because God is eternal, without beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27 just speaks of the eternal God who is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. And again, the fact that God is eternal, that once more has consequences, that God is going to be dependable, which we've got to say something more about that as we go along this morning. But I think it's interesting that God was never young and God will never be old. Think about that, Reuben. Never Isn't young. That a great, <laughs> isn't that a great thing, though, to never be old? Like, as you continue to get older, you realize, you know, getting old isn't all that it's cut out to be, right? But I think, I think that's a distinction between uh, the true God, Jehovah, God of the Bible, and some of the, the false pagan gods. You know, if you read some of the myths of these false gods that maybe Babylon or Egypt worship, you realize that they were almost human. They were born and they die. But scripture tells us 
tells us that the true God, you know, he's, he was not born, like you said, he was, he was not young and he does not die, he does not get old, he's, he's eternal. And that just shows how amazing this God is. Well, the passage we began our worship with this morning, Revelation 4, 8, spoke of the God who was, who is, and is to come. And you look at those three points, God was, that is, he always was, he had no beginning. God is, that is, he continues to exist, and who is to come. That is, he will last forever. So never young, never old. But about the nature of God, I think that's a difficult thing when we talk about how God is a spirit. That is, he's not a fleshly, physical being. Uh, In John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But to say that he's not a physical being, that hardly describes what he is. Uh, One point that I would make, though, and you referenced the idols a moment ago, in the context of John chapter 4, Jesus taught that since God is spirit, he can be worshipped in every place and is not limited as were the idols. You know, we may not understand all that's involved in God being purely spirit, but we can have confidence that that's an expression of his greatness, Reuben. That's exactly right. And again, like you said, it's a difference between the idols and the true God. The idols, uh, the people who serve these idols, they believed that they were local gods. They believed that the, that these gods only had power over their own nation. An example, the, the God of Egypt only had power over Egypt. He didn't have power over these other nations. But the true God uh, has authority over the entire universe. And again, that just shows God's greatness. Yeah, and I want to also make this observation. uh, I want to look at Psalm 139 and uh, talking about the fact that God is omniscient. Uh, God is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He knows everything. You know, we live in a a wonderful age, an age of scientific advancement and uh, technology, and we pride ourselves in our knowledge and insight. And, you know, when you get your latest iPhone, you say, wow, look at, look at what this thing will do. Look at what we know now about technology. But we don't know anything compared to God. I think we must appear foolish to God when we right. think, Reuben, that we know so much. But our God is an all-knowing God. Just listen to this from Psalm 139, beginning at verse 1. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And here in verse 6, David just makes it clear that the kind of knowledge that God has is beyond the knowledge that men have. And so, again, I think we must uh, appear foolish to God when we pride ourselves on how much we know. We know nothing, actually. Yeah, and I I think you're exactly right on that. We do pride ourselves on what we know on scientific advancements. You know, there was a wise man who once said that our priests still wear white. They just wear lab coats. And the idea behind that is we sort of worship knowledge now. We worship science and, 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 and learning more. But as you said, God is the one who has all knowledge. He's the one who truly is all-knowing. And I think this is tied to creation. God created truth. God created reality. So God is the one who defines truth and reality. And if, if we don't agree with God, then we're just wrong. That's just how it is. And I think John and Jesus in the gospel of John takes this even further. In John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I think this, Jesus tells us something about deity. He says that God is truth. So God not only creates truth, but he is truth. And that's why God is, is, is all-knowing. Not only is he all-knowing, but he is good. Uh, In Matthew chapter 19, remember when the the young man came to Jesus and he called him good teacher or good master, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. And of course, Jesus is intending to teach this young man that he, Jesus himself, is God. But the point that is being made here is that 
God is inherently good. And we ourselves, while we were created upright, we went astray. And you cannot say of any of us that we are completely good. And right. being that God is good, what God does is always good. And it's always the right thing. I remember, Reuben, when uh, the Lord was looking at uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was looking for uh, a handful of righteous men. And Abraham said, shall not the God of all the earth do right? Well, whatever God does, it is right. It's against God's nature to do evil. You got passages like uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, where Paul said that he lived in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. And so God, as you pointed out, God is truth. He always speaks truth. And the reason for that is that God is inherently good. And we look at our own lives and, well, you know, we point to someone and say, well, there goes a good man or she's a good woman. But that's only good in a relative sense, not in the sense that God is good. God is inherently good. Yeah. And I think that, again, goes back to creation. God defines what is good. He is able to create uh, what is good. You know, uh, our definition or our standard for good is, is not what we define as good. Uh, someone might say, might look at what God uh, does or says in his criticizing of, of certain sins. And they may say, well, God's wrong about that. Well, no, God isn't wrong about that. He's the creator of the universe. He has all authority. He tells us what is good. So part of God being completely good is he defines it. It's his standard and, and not our own standard. And it's kind of interesting when people say, well, God is wrong about this, or God is wrong about that. They always have to appeal to God's standard for what is good and what is right. You know, someone says, well, you know, uh, uh, like I, I had a young lady tell me the Bible is true on just about everything except for what it says about homosexuality. God is wrong about that. Well, what she had done is set herself up as the standard, but the fact that she declared something to be wrong about God, where does morality come from? Our God exactly. is, a, is a God who defines what morality is. And whenever someone wants to judge God and say God has done something wrong, they always have to appeal to God's standard of right and wrong in order to, to do that. But not only is God good, God is love, and that's 1 John 4, 8. I think if people know any verse from the book of 1 John, they know that, where the text just says God is love. But that presents a difficulty. It, it has led some people to believe that because God is love, he cannot be a God of judgment. And what they mm -hmm. do is set up a false dilemma. Uh, they take a complex yeah. issue, and they say, well, only two choices are possible. Since God is good and God is love, he cannot be a God of judgment because if he judged men, well, that would make him evil. How would you answer that, Reuben? Well, like you said, it's a false dilemma or a false dichotomy where people are putting up and it says, and they say it has to be either this or it has to be this. And they fail to realize that it could, it could be both. It could be a mix of both. And I think that's the answer. God's love and God's judgment are just two sides of, of the same coin. Uh, God judges us because he loves and cares for us. Uh, we see this throughout the prophets, but in the book of Hosea uh, that we studied, I think about a month or three weeks ago, something like that. In the book uh, of Hosea, God is punishing his people because they've committed immorality against him. They are cheating on him with their possessions. They're cheating on him with other gods, and they're cheating on him with other nations. However, in the last chapter of the book of Hosea, God doesn't talk about punishment or, 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 or judging the people like he talked about in, in most of the other book. Instead, God talks about healing and blessing Israel because of their repentance. So even in the book of Hosea, where God is punishing his people for immorality, judgment is not the last word. Instead, God talks about repentance that leads to healing and blessing. And, and I think the point is this, judgment is, is not an end in itself. God doesn't just use judgment or, or, or punishment just because he wants to. God judges to encourage repentance. So, so judgment flows out of love, and it's not this false dilemma of, well, it's either this or this. They're, they're both working together as two sides of the same coin. Yes, goodness and judgment can go together. In fact, if you fail to see that God's goodness has to be accompanied by judgment, then you've got a God 
who tolerates evil and he's no longer good. That presents a, a, more, a much more difficult dilemma. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Here is a plain declaration of Scripture that God exercises loving kindness and judgment. Again, as you said, two sides of the same coin. Uh, yeah. The Bible declares that God is good, but it yeah. also declares that he can be severe in judgment. Behold, the goodness and the severity of God, says Romans eleven twenty two. 22. That's right. Uh, thus, God, when he deals with evil, he is being just in dealing with evil. How many yeah. passages are there that talk about God's justice? And, you know, if God just allows wickedness to continue with doing nothing about it, then God becomes an unjust God. Sometimes, right. Reuben, you hear people say things like, well, how could a just and loving God punish anyone? Well, a just God, that's what he does. He does yeah. punish. Yeah. And it's interesting that some people are, are never satisfied on this issue. They're kind of like the children that we read about in Matthew. Kind of they're either going to criticize God if he does, or they're going to criticize God if he doesn't. It doesn't really matter. So if God doesn't punish evil, people will sort of wag their finger and say, well, how could God see this evil happening and not do anything about it? But then if God does punish evil like he does in the Bible, they wag their finger again at God and say, well, how could God do that if he's such a loving God? So it seems that some people are never satisfied on this. But the the point is right. God is a just God. He He will punish evil whenever he sees it. Well, yeah, the idea of finding fault with God no matter what he does that's just one way that men have of trying to escape accountability to God. If I can find some reason of looking at God, some way of looking at God that says God is wrong, then I don't have to obey him. At least that's what we think. You know, uh, people argue that God, sometimes people argue that God is an evil God. He's not. The Bible declares his goodness. But if God is an evil God, He's still God. And of course, I'm not suggesting that he's evil, but if God is whatever God is, and we still are under obligation to obey him. Over in the book of Romans in chapter 12 and verse 19, the scripture says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so God is just toward evil. He deals with evil because it has to be dealt with. I think we could summarize what we've said so far by saying God's the eternal creator. He knows everything. He exercises love and mercy and justice toward all. Those are all facts about God, but there are some conclusions that we need to draw from this. And I think one of the things that we need to say is that God is dependable. You know, Reuben, uh, everything that we deal with on this earth, including one another, uh, we tend to be Uh, we tend to lack dependability. I'll say it that way. Our technology fails us, just like my mic failed a little bit ago. Our cars break down. uh, The light bulb burns out. People make promises, and they don't keep their promises. Maybe they had good intentions, but they were not able to keep a promise. Listen, God is dependable. Uh, You can always count on him. He's not fickle. He's not changeable as men are. There's a passage in James chapter 1 that we often quote on this, and I think it's worthy of noting right here. In James chapter 1 and uh, verse 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is God, and he's always the same. You can depend on him. Uh, This text not only teaches that God provides for us and that he's good, but he did good toward us yesterday, and he's going to do good for us today, and he's going to do good for us tomorrow. There's so much to say about the dependability of God. Yeah, isn't isn't that what we see 
throughout scripture, sort of God's plan being worked out. You know, it's interesting, the Bible, like any good story has like conflict or tension. You sort of at times wonder if, if the plan is going to work out. It seems at times that the plan is in danger. Uh, you, in the book of Exodus, we see that, right? It seems like the plan is in danger. God's people, how are they going to get to the land? They're, they're stuck. They're, they're stuck in slavery to this powerful nation. How are they going to make it? In, in the book of Esther, we see that as well. Uh, God's people are threatened. They are, they're, they're, they are threatened by destruction. This powerful nation that almost never loses uh, has, has, has worked to destroy God's people. How are they going to get out of it? But even when it looks like the plan is in danger, what we see throughout the scripture is that God comes through. God is dependable. Like you said, he's not like us. You know, we all have those people who we wouldn't try and contact if we got into a car accident because they don't pick up their phones, right? I might be one of those people for some people, you know, because I keep my phone on silent a lot. But, you know, we all have that person. I'm not going to call him if I get into a car accident. They will never answer their phone. Um, God isn't that way. God always comes through. He's dependable. Yeah. And, you know, God is going to bring us through this coronavirus virus too. I think that's important that we recognize that, you know, it is the circumstance of planet Earth that from time to time we go through terrible episodes. And we're in the middle of one of those episodes right now. But hey, we're still alive. We're still eating. We still have a place to sleep at night. We still have food in our mouths and uh, we're still able to, to uh, conduct our, our lives to some degree. And uh, God continues to provide. We, we began our lesson by looking at Genesis 1.29, where God said, I have given, talking about the things that he's given that sustain us. And God has continued to sustain us now for these many centuries, even millennia. In Psalm number 18, Psalm 18 and verse number 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. And I like the middle of that verse where it says, the word of the Lord is proven. You referenced the exodus out of Egypt. God yeah. said he was going to deliver his people. In fact, more than 400 years before the people were brought out of Egyptian slavery, Reuben, more than 400 years earlier, God said, I'm going to bring this people out. He said that to Abraham. And yeah. the word of the Lord is proven, isn't it? It's been demonstrated right. to be reliable over and over again. And one more verse in Psalm 119. And verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. And, and so God's faithfulness, his word settled, whatever God has said, it's going to stand. And we don't have to worry about somehow God failing or his word failing. You can count on God. He will never vary. He will never lie, never make a mistake or fail to carry out a promise. Uh, the, I, I want to also talk about God's power. We've seen something about his power already in that he created everything. Genesis chapter one records the beginning of everything that we see. All of life was spoken into existence by our Lord. Our God rules the universe over in the book of Daniel. Uh, what was it that Nebuchadnezzar learned uh, that God rules in the kingdom of men? Of men. That's yeah. Right. God's in charge, isn't he? Yeah. That's exactly right. God rules the universe. And I think this speaks a little bit to who God is. You know, this is something that really only, only God can say. Humans can rule some things, right? We have presidents, we have, we have CEOs, we have very important, very powerful people. Uh, but those people don't rule everything like God does. God is the one who truly rules the kingdoms of men. And King Nebuchadnezzar, I guess he had to learn that the hard way. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people have learned that lesson the hard way. You know, God knows the future. He can foretell it. He can even bring it to pass. Uh, that, again, is a demonstration of his power. In Romans chapter 4, and let me see if I can find the verse quickly. In Romans chapter 4 and verse number 17, in talking about uh, Abraham and the relationship that God had with him, uh, the text here says, uh, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. That statement was made to Abraham before Abraham had any children, before there were any nations that came from Abraham. But it says, God speaks of things which do not exist as though they did. God knew what the future of Abraham and his posterity would be, and God foretold it, and God brought it to pass. 
And such a being right. as that is not only worthy of our interest, but of our obedience and our praise. And I, I want to add to that, that God is unique. You know, you said a moment ago that men may have power. Kings, presidents, premiers, governors, they have some power. But there's no one like God. There is no is one like him with respect to power. No one like him with respect to being. Uh, in, back in Deuteronomy, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. And that word for one is a Hebrew word which indicates a united one, a unity. There's one God, but the scripture declares that there are three persons in the Godhead, but there's no one like, equal to, or higher than our God, Ruben. Yeah, that's right. And you see that in God's power. You, know, you mentioned God's power. God, God, God is the one who created everything. Well, who else can say that? Only God can say that. God is, uh, we, we talked about that when we talked about Genesis 1-1. God is the only one who truly creates. So only God can say that he created everything. Uh, one of the points that I had under God's power that we didn't talk about is that God has the power over life and death. Well, who else can say that? Uh, well, only, only God can say that. God is the only one who has true power anyway over life and death. And scripture makes that clear. Uh, in Genesis, we, we see language in the Old Testament in general, we see language about how God closed their womb. Well, the idea is God has power over life. You know, some people may have a limited power over death. For instance, a jury and a judge can sentence someone to death, but only God has true power over death. In Matthew, we read it just, I believe, last week or the week before that, do not fear those who can kill the body, but God who can destroy both body and soul. So only God has that power, that true power over life and death. And only God, as you said earlier, knows the future and can bring it to, back, to pass. No one can truly do that. Some people may claim they can do that, but we see that they can. Only God can do that. So, the, so God's power shows us that he is indeed a, a unique God. Yeah, I'm looking here at Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9. When we talk about the unique nature of God, this passage is powerful. God says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. This is written in a context about idolatry. And in the larger context here of Isaiah, God says to these idols or to the idol worshipers along with their idols, he said, okay, let's see you all do something. Let's see you foretell the future. Uh, can you create something? Let's, let's, I'll stand back and watch. You present your case. Show me what you can create. And yeah. of course, there is no answer because these that uh, so many of the people worship, they were not God. They were not gods at all. And, and so when God says there is no one like me, uh, that tells us something significant. And as a consequence of all that we've seen this morning, we talk about God as the creator. God is powerful. God is love. God has complete authority. Reuben, you had something else I think you wanted to add to that. Uh, j just at the end, you were talking about that Isaiah passage where God is challenging the idols. Look, if, if, you, if you are truly a God, then predict the future. And what we see in Isaiah is God eventually does go on to predict the future whenever he, he, he foretells of Cyrus by name. You know, some critics of the Bible say, well, that was added to Isaiah later. No, it just it fits in with the point. Uh, God is telling these idols, you predict the future. And really, they can't. So God goes on to predict the future. And yeah. you can go on to your next point that you were making. Okay, so all that, all that we've seen about God, you add all these things up. He's the creator. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. God has complete authority. Now, authority is the right to command. It's the right to expect obedience. And God's authority is absolute. He has the undisputed right to, to command all people. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament uh, is Exodus chapter 5 and the opening of that chapter. There you've got uh, Moses being sent by the Lord to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Well, Pharaoh was about to find out who the Lord about is. About to find out. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and because God has the right to command. He's got the right to command Pharaoh. And he's got the right to command you and me and everyone on the planet. What gives him that right? Well, the fact that he is the creator. Uh, the passage that we saw earlier in Genesis 1.29, just two verses preceding that, 
God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God is the creator of man. Over in the book of Psalms, let me see if I can find the verse quickly. In Psalm number 100, I was looking at this verse before our online worship this morning. In Psalm 100, and in verse number three, it says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And so God is responsible for our very existence. Reuben? Yeah, and this idea that God has complete authority because of, you know, because of who he is and everything he's done for us, I think this is something that we need to remind ourselves of because we live in a culture that repeatedly tells us that we are in charge of, of our own lives. You know, and I think that's why sometimes Christians fail to truly live as disciples. We sort of adopt the, me the, the, the thinking of the culture and who sort of think like Pharaoh. They, they say, well, who is this God? that I should listen to him. You know, see, our culture doesn't truly see Christ as king. So Christianity, it almost seems that Christianity in, in sort of the wider religious term isn't really about pleasing the king anymore. It's, it's more about pleasing self. Uh, we need to re continually remind ourselves that God is in control. He has all authority. And, and we carry our cross uh, which is what, what Jesus tells us to do, that true disciples carry their cross. We carry our cross because the king with all authority expects us to, to carry our cross. So that's something we need to remind ourselves of. Well, yeah. And in Psalm number two, it's interesting there what the text says uh, about God being the ruler over all. You mentioned the kings of the earth. And here Psalm two begins with this statement. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And here, the idea in this psalm is that people say, oh, well, let's get together and let's all reject God, because we don't want God to rule over us. We want to be the master. We want to rule over all things. And here's right. God's response to that in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This course, this text, of course, Reuben, is a messianic prophecy about the Jesus, the, the Messiah who would come, the anointed one of God. But here it, it portrays the kings of the earth as aligning themselves against God. And of course, that's what happened uh, in the Jews and the Gentiles gathering together to plot against Jesus and to kill him. But the truth is, the kings of the earth have no power and authority when compared to the awesome God. And so God is the ruler over all things. And while he doesn't always bring judgment immediately, he doesn't always bring judgment immediately, he will indeed judge men. According to Acts 17, right. there's coming a day of judgment. I, I find it interesting that sometimes the agnostic or the atheist will say, well, if there's a God, uh, I curse him. I speak against him. I shake my fist at him. And if there is a God, let him strike me dead immediately. Well, <laughs> there is a God, but you're challenging God in that way. God is under no obligation to answer you because right. God makes it clear that there's coming a day of judgment and it's not going to be decided by you on the day that you shake your fist against God. In Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and 31, it says, God now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Notice the scripture says that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. And so since God made us, he has the right to judge us. And we will be judged by the great God who is. Yeah, Max, that's, a, that's exactly right. And this, I like this idea that you laid out here in Psalm chapter 2. People who, who, who plan and scheme against God, and God just, just laughs. You know, you may scheme against God, uh, but you have no control over God. People, us, we don't have control over God. The person who shakes his fist at God and says, if you, if you truly exist, strike me down. Oh, who is God that he has to listen to anyone? 
of us. God is the almighty. He has all power. And our, our plans, our scheming will, will never change or even be able to oppose his plans. Well, that's true. And as we're about to wrap up our lesson, we need to talk about one more thing, Reuben. And that is, where do we fit in? What's our standing before God? Uh, does God know us? Uh, what does he think of us? You know, the, the classic text of the Bible, the golden text, John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That tells us a great deal about God. He knows and he loves all people. And the truth is, Reuben, God wants every one of us to come and be with him in heaven for eternity. You know, when you summarize the plan of the Bible, beginning with the creation, uh, with the promises to Abraham, with the coming of the nation of Israel, with the coming of Jesus into the world, with the completion of the New Testament record, all of it is ultimately about us being with God in heaven for yeah. eternity. And what is it? Second Peter chapter three and verse nine. God is not willing that any of us should perish, but perish. that we should all come to repentance. Why? Yeah. Well, because we've sinned and sin's our problem. And that's the thing that's going to keep us from heaven. And so we need to deal with the sin problem, Ruben. Yeah, that's, and, and, and that's just amazing to me. I mean, think about the God that we have just described, the God who creates all things, who's, who's in charge of everything, who holds life and death in his hands, the God uh, who has all authority. Uh, this God has so much power. But he loves and cares about us. Uh, he loves and cares about you, Max, uh, about even me, right? <laughs> Th think about some of the, the most powerful people that you know. I think about the president, any president. It doesn't have to be a specific one. Uh, the president doesn't love me as an individual person. He doesn't even know me. But God knows and loves me, and he has set out a plan to, to save me from my problem, my sin. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And listen, God does not owe us anything. He does not owe us a way of salvation. And yet, because of his grace, because he is a merciful God, he provides us a way of salvation. God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to die in our sins and be separated uh, from him. Reuben, without God, we have no hope. Uh, like someone says, you don't have a prayer. Without God, you don't have a prayer. And we have no way to deal with the sin problem. Jesus is the answer to the sin problem. I think it was in our Wednesday night study this past week, I think you brought up 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it said, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That is, God made him to be a sin sacrifice. And so if you ask the question, what's the Bible all about? From beginning to end, it's the record of God's plan to save us from our sin. But what does God demand? He wants us to submit our lives to him. You know, we talk about having faith in Jesus. Uh, we talk about repenting of sin. We talk about confession of Christ, being baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sins. That's about God's plan for us. God wants us to submit our lives to him. And, and remember, we're the ones who wronged God by violating his law. We need to do what he said. We can't, we can't dictate our, our own way of forgiveness or our own plan of salvation. We have to do things the way God has directed us. Ruben, a final thought. No, I think we need to wrap. I've got nothing else. Uh, this is a great study, Max. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, your, your part in the study and hope that folks were encouraged. Uh, the God of the Bible is the God who is. He is the eternal, all-knowing, loving God who loves us with an immeasurable love. He's unique. He's dependable. And you can safely entrust to God the safekeeping of your soul. You can obey him through faith, repentance, and baptism. And indeed, you can be saved. What's the Bible about? It's about God's love for people like you and me. God, because he has seen our sins, has mounted a rescue plan through Jesus Christ to redeem us and to bring us back to him. Reuben, why don't you close our lesson with a prayer, and then we do have some final thoughts. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we pray that we have pleased you with our worship service today, because as Christians, that really is a, that's really our ultimate goal. We, we strive to please you. Father, we pray that you will be with those of us who are 
sick and those of us who are struggling, we pray that you will be with them, comfort them, and strengthen them, and bring them back to, to their health, Father. Father, we pray that you will be with us as we go throughout this week, uh, this month, and this year. We know that we live in an evil world, but we pray that uh, we strive to live according to your will and be a good example to those around us. Father, we know that you have all authority. We, have, we know that you have all power. We know that you are dependable, Father. And that's why we lie our, or we lay our hopes on you. Father, we pray all this on your, in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, some final thoughts. We'd invite uh, our kids uh, to join us for Bible Drill at 5 p.m. today. And by the way, you don't have to be a kid. You can go to our Facebook page and you, you can see the Bible Drill there on Facebook. Uh, Monday evening study tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Ruben, you're doing tomorrow evening study. Think you're going to be right. talking about man, about the being created God? in God's image. Yeah. What and a little mean? bit about what that means. Yeah, we're going to answer okay. that question on Monday. <laughs> Great. And for our elders and deacons, uh, we're going to be having a Zoom meeting on Tuesday at seven o'clock. And then Wednesday, we've got text talk. And we're in Matthew chapter 12 this week. And look, it's been good to be with everyone this morning. Uh, until we talk again, may the awesome God, may he bless and prosper you.